Okay, I'm starting again. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. And uh, a little background. So, I actually, I think I attended the first, the very first EMAX Berlin meetup, um, which was more than four years ago. And I attended the first couple of ones, but then kids happened, and uh, EMAX went down a couple of roles in the priority list. But now kids are a bit older, so I can attend it again. And yeah, it's, it's uh, great to be here. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, smooth test-driven development in the US. And I'm going to be talking about some uh, stuff that I've been working on, some code that I've been working on, what I want to achieve, what the aim is, and uh, what problems, issues that I'm facing. And I'm looking forward to your feedback and inputs that you might have. So uh, what is smooth TDD? Um, so essentially the test-driven development of TDD group is very simple. So you write a test when you're starting with a feature, you write a test that fails, you write some code, make it green, and then if there's any refactoring that has to be done, you refactor it, you do the refactoring, and try to keep the test uh, green. And then you keep on doing this, and at some point you think that you're done, and yeah, everything is great. So as it's a loop, uh, you're running the tests um, multiple times at each step. So you write the test, you run it, it's red. You write the code, you run the test again, it's green. You refactor, you run the test again, it's green. You go back again. So at each step of the loop, uh, you're running the test uh, three times. And the thing is, you are not running this one test, but what you usually have is you have like your unit test, you run it to make sure that you've actually written the feature that you wanted, and then you've got your uh, module level test, you've got your test suite, and then you run the test suite to make sure that you haven't broken anything else. Um, and you are running tests at different levels. You're uh, running your um, test suite, and then something fails, and then you run it again, you try to fix it, you run it again, etc., etc. So essentially what you're doing is just running tests the whole time. So I'm not going to talk about the uh, virtues of TDD, that's not the topic of this test. I'm going to talk about uh, what I've done to make it simpler in uh, Emacs and what I want to, to make it simpler in, for Elis. So, um, yeah, years ago, actually, at the first meetup, I mentioned uh, ABL mode, which is a TDD mode that I wrote uh, while working at Ableton. That's why it's called ABL mode. And I'm just going to give you a very short demo of what that involves. So, let's split the screen. Let's just take a test. Uh, file. So this is the test file, and this is a standard Python uh, unit test file. Uh, so imports uh, unit test test case, and then there's a setup, and then there's a test session store. And then uh, the ABR mode is activated here. Uh, we can see this by looking at the help, and then let's go down. Um, so where's ABR mode? Let's search for it. Well, Yes, ABL minor mode. And what does the ABL minor mode do? So when you're in a test, you've got a number of key bindings. So one of them is control CT. So what control CT does is it jumps to, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to nail this down and then explain what's happening. So here you're in the uh, test method. And what ABL mode does is uh, it finds which test you're in, it determines the file and the class and it constructs um, whatever path has to be, whatever test path has to be run, so individual test that you're trying to run, and then it uh, runs it by running a relatively complicated looking command that actually doesn't do that much. So uh, what it does is, it first of all goes to that directory, a second. so it goes to the directory of the test, blah, 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 um, it activates a virtual environment, work on, that's what it does. So in Python, there is virtual environments. How many of you are Python developers or know at least some Python? Okay, cool, I don't have to, cool, nice. I don't have to give too much detail. It activates the virtual environment and then it calls the um, uh, command to run this test. So pytest, a minus xq, make it silent and fail in the first, stop in the first failing test, traceback is native, and then this is the so this thing that you're seeing here, test session store by session store, blah, 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 blah. This is the path to this test. So it runs this one test. And it's failing. Uh, and it's telling you that it's telling you 
actually it does a message, but it gets overwritten by something else that the test is failing. And what you can do, this is something that came out of practice where I was running individual tests and then test classes and then test files, etc. is if you, for example, instead of uh, the uh, test method, if you go up into the test class, then you can run that one and then it runs the class as you can see in the uh, command that it runs, um, session store test, so it runs the class. So um, this has been serving me really well. Um, um, since I wrote it, I'm going to, and I recently got back to it uh, because I needed some improvements. And um, so I'll just pull up the file for this mode. So this is relatively straightforward. It's a relatively straightforward uh, Python uh, ELS minor mode. And the code is relatively straightforward, but as we all know, in dynamic languages, the relatively straightforward code can get relatively hairy uh, once you uh, start introducing new features and you need tests for it, just like in Python. And in that respect, ELS is very similar to Python. And so after I actually managed to get it to run, years ago, I actually wrote some tests for it. Oops, sorry, that was the wrong key binding. So let's look at the tests. Yes, of course, just one second. Is this better? No, it's better. All right, let's look at the tests. Um, so actually, I go back to the slides uh, for this bit. So that was the Python test mode, the ABL mode, and as I said, that has been serving me really well for a while. Um, and yeah, the next thing that I wanted to do for uh, the ABL mode was write test and new list. So nice thing is in Emacs, the basics are there. There's ERT, the Emacs regression testing module. And what you can do with it is, as you can see here, so for example, this is a test, and you've got a macro where you can define uh, tests, ERT get test. And uh, then what you can do is you can use methods like shoot, uh, and then string equal, equal, et cetera, et cetera. You can use different kinds of equality. And this is like the most basic uh, test runner that you need, right? Uh, so that's there. What else is there? There's the batch mode. So you can call Emacs uh, as a runtime without actually popping the visual interface. So that also works. And there are packages. It's not the best in the world. There are languages with better package management. But you can actually say install these packages and, and Emacs actually does that. But that's not good enough. Um, so what's missing, first of all, there's the simplified test running with the simple single key binding. Uh, so in ABI mode, I can do control CT and then it runs that one test. So uh, that's not there. And one thing that's uh, sorely, sorely missing um, in the sense that there isn't, the, the practice is not there, is the virtual ends of Python. So in Python, you've got these virtual environments where you can just create this sandbox. I mean, okay, you, can, uh, you know about this. You can create a sandbox and just install packages and try things out, what works with uh, what else, and then you can try different packages. So that's really great, and that's uh, missing in Emacs. And there is this fundamental problem, and that's the fact that you are changing your editor while uh, you are working on this code. So let's say, for example, I'm working on ABM mode. I mean, not for example, this happens frequently. So I'm working on ABM mode, and I'm changing it, and I'm loading the files so that I can use it, uh, try out new features, etc. run the tests. And in the middle of that, there is something that I need to work in Python, and suddenly ABL mode is not working. Why? Because I'm working on it, because I just changed it. So um, I need to be able to run the test in some other environment from the one that I'm uh, editing it in, right? And this is the problem that I'm trying to solve now. So what I would like to do is I would like to um, uh, extend ABL mode to ELISP, and have these features so that I can um, do what I'm calling now smooth TDD in Elis. So I'm going to show you what I've been, um, what I've done, what I've been trying to do. So 
let's go to the end of this. Uh, so the first thing that I want to tackle is running individual tests. And um, the thing is, of course, ERT has that option. You can just call ERT with the name of a um, uh, with the name of a, a test. But again, this is in the same editor that you're working, with, right? So let's say you want to test, you want to run one of the tests, and you just give it the name of the test, but that works in the same environment that you're working. With. And this is exactly what I want to avoid. So what's the alternative? The alternative I came up with is passing an argument to Emacs uh, when it's running in uh, when it's running as a test. So let's say you want to run one of the tests, which is uh, let's go to the file. And let's search for ERT. The test. So the first test in this file is test AB parameters. So let's say I want to run this one uh, test. Uh, I want to be able to pass it as an argument uh, when I uh, start Emacs. And the nice thing is there's actually, apparently there, there's, um, uh, there are um, constructs in ELISP with, uh, which you can uh, use. So there's a command line args left. So what Emacs does is, when it starts up, it starts consuming the command line args that are coming in, and then dropping them from the list, from the command line args list. That's what it's called. And uh, at the end, once the fundamental init is done, it has command line args left. And then you can either register um, uh, functions that use, these, uh, that use these command lines, or what you can do is you can just set command line args left to nil, and then it will ignore whatever's left. So this is what I used, and uh, here's how it works. Um, it might take me a couple of minutes to set this up, but I promise you it will work at the end. Okay, I'll just try typing it in. That should also work. So the first thing we need to do is we need to make it not load the init file, because otherwise what you're doing is you're starting your normal uh, Emacs session. So this does that, and we need to also load the uh, directory in which we are developing in development. So this is the ABL mode development directory where I've got a different, uh, this should be better. So I've got a different um, ABI mode environment, and then uh, what you want to do is you want to um, load the test file. And uh, okay, so this should, for example, run all the tests. So this takes a while. This is running all the tests that are in the uh, test that the other uh, file. So okay, I've got two Emacs now. Which one is the real Emacs? Okay, so this is the test at the R directory. So the test at the R directory, what it's doing is it's calling this run elisp tests function that you're seeing at the top. So there's some noise in between that I'm going to get back to in a minute. So it's calling that function at the very end, just as a, a top level function. So what that thing is doing is it's checking whether there, whether there are any uh, arguments that are passed in with the run test. Is mapping the uh, this uh, lambda that's uh, uh, looking at whether there are any um, uh, arguments that come in as run test through command line args left, and if there are any, if there are tests, then it's calling that. If there aren't any, it's just calling ERT T, ERT true. So what's that doing is uh, it's um, uh, calling the whole test suite. So that's kind of okay because. When you want to, you should be able to uh, run all the tests. But what we want to do is we want to be able to pass arguments. And uh, this is actually, with this setup, this is actually possible. We can pass and run tests. And we can say test ADL utils. And then this actually runs that one file. No, actually, one second. Run test, I'm sorry. Let's close this. So run test. 
test. And this should now run this one test. Exactly. So it runs the one test. So there's the ERT buffer. It runs this one test. And then, so the reason the, I'm not closing the window, it's also possible to just say kill Emacs. But then if the test fails, I, this is something else I'm going to work on. Closing the window uh, conditionally, if the test fails, maybe you want to see some debug information so it's not just <coughs> closing the window. Uh, the window. This is also the reason, I mean, otherwise what you can, of course, do is you can just call batch and this will uh, uh, not pop up the interface at all, which is also uh, a mode that you can uh, use. Okay, so that covers uh, the first point, simplified test running. So as said, what I want to do is uh, I would like to um, integrate this to, uh, into ABL mode so that you can, using the same key binding, you can actually run an individual test. Uh, in, on the command line. Um, so this uh, setup pretty much handles that. It's just a matter of hooking it into the uh, key bindings. So there's this other problem, single space for packages. This is a bit more complicated because it involves package EL. And package EL is a bit complicated. So um, it's, um, I mean, it does what it should do, but there are a couple of things that it can't do. And it wasn't really built to do, so the idea of sandboxes doesn't exist. Um, but it's actually very easy to simulate by just telling it to install stuff in a certain directory. And, but the question is how to tool this. So how do you um, go around uh, creating the sandbox and then running tests in it? So the flaw that I came up with is the same one with um, the Python one, where you can um, create a sandbox, you can tell uh, Emacs to uh, create the sandbox and then give you the parameters to actually run stuff in it, and then you can run tests in the sandbox. So how does this work? Um, this is the, uh, the, the function for doing this, so create package sandbox. So what it does is you can call it when you're in a package file. So uh, the package EL uh, package uh, has some nice functions which you can use in order to get information out of a um, uh, package file. So let's look at the package file. AML.EL, AML.EL. So let's go to the top. This is the package header. Header. It tells uh, many things to the package EL. And there's actually a separate package that um, EL main thing or something like that that's written by, what was the name of the gun nut? Um, who, was, who used to be, he wrote this book, Cathedral and the Bazaar. Uh, Eric Raymond. Uh, exactly, Eric Raymond. He, actually, Eric Raymond wrote, uh, wrote it originally. And um, what it does is it passes the header. So it, if, you, uh, if you give the file, the buffer of a package, it will tell you the author, the URL version, etc. And um, you can use this in package buffer info. So package buffer info when called as a, um, uh, as a function. Uh, inside a package file, it will give you a package information. So here, package is this uh, common list struct that has all that information. And then uh, you can use the attributes of that uh, struct. You can use like name. Um, so here, these are the, uh, this is unfortunately now uh, hard coded, the directory in which the sandbox is created. This is all going to change. But um, yeah, so you can use the dependencies. This is the most important thing. Actually, uh, I'm going to explain that later. So, so what's happening here is this function, when called, so it's interactive, you can call it within a package file, and it will um, get package information, and then it will create this directory, the sandbox directory. It's in temp sandbox, so it's using the package name. So this will be called ABR mode sandbox. And then within that directory, it will write two files. And you can see the contents of this, those files in the previous two dev files. One is init file content, the other is install file content. So init file content, this is the init file. And what that does is it just initializes the package. Uh, uh, package. I hate calling it package package, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's what it is. And uh, so what you need to add Malpa to that, uh, to the uh, package archives list, because uh, the default one doesn't have all the packages. And package initialize, and if there are no archive contents, then fetch the refresh the archive contents. And then 
there's another file, which is the install file. So what this one does is uh, the uh, it requires the module that you are trying to install, right? That's for ABL mode, it requires the ABL mode and then uses the symbol of that mode to get the file in which it is defined. So this might not be a 100% cool idea because there are packages where the package information is in a separate file. I need to figure that out, maybe run a couple of tests. There might be a better and corrected way of doing this. And then, uh, yeah, here it creates again the package info, package profile info, uses package profile info to get the package info, and then uses uh, two functions from within the package module, download transaction and compute transaction, to, uh, to install the requirements of this package. Um, so, I'm going to do a very simple demo of this. So, the um, sandbox is created in temp. I'm just going to remove whatever is in there right now. I need to be very careful typing this. And create the um, sandbox. So, let's move this. And um, so, let's go to the ABL mode. Exactly, and then let's uh, run the command to create package sandbox. So we run this, and it says, okay, files are created. And one other thing that this um, method, this function does is it copies a command to actually run these files in the sandbox so that uh, uh, the files are installed. This is actually, I'm going to also move this into uh, um, um, into the ABL mode package so that this runs in the shell within Emacs. But we can paste this here, and if you run this, then Emacs pops up and it starts downloading stuff. The last time I ran it, it worked with problems. Let's see what happens. Okay, so it worked. Um, so let's just remove this and then let's see whatever's in that directory. So yeah, so there's, there's init EL, install EL, and then there's a package directory. Let's see what's in the package directory. So there is, yeah, uh, whatever, uh, the files that package EL created and dependency, which is S. So this is now installed. And now what you can do is you can actually run uh, the tests that we ran just a second ago. Let's go there, yes, exactly, and um, yeah, so there's there's one thing that you might think would be simpler, which is just tell Emacs. So let's have a look at the file, the contents of the files that are written. Ah, no, not that one. Don't be clever. And let's have a look at the contents of install. And you would you would think that it would make sense to actually open the file for ABI mode and just tell package. Uh, to install that buffer, which we can do. We can just say package install buffer from file. No, package install uh, from buffer. But what that does is it doesn't link to the file you are working on, it actually copies it. So that's not what you want, because then you've got in your sandbox, you've got uh, a copy of the um, uh, code that you want to edit, and that's not really what you want. This is very similar to in Python, doing pip install dash e, where you do a development build where stuff is linked instead of just doing instead of doing pip install uh, and dot, which copies all the stuff into the virtual environment. So that's why uh, what it's doing is it's doing this uh, convoluted thing where it's getting the dependency information and installing dependencies. But we can still um, run this um, thing. And uh, wait a second, I need to tell it to use this one directory. So yeah, then you can run it in the sandbox. So you are telling it to send the sandbox in file and you can put whatever you want in there, uh, use this directory for packages, that directory for other stuff, etc. and networks. 
So um, this actually covers like this functionality, which is not really well integrated into uh, the editor flow right now. Uh, actually covers uh, pretty much exactly what I need. Um, and so the questions are, as I said, like different kinds of packages. So there is there are packages that consist of multiple files, of course. How do you deal with those? Where do you get the info from? It shouldn't be uh, impossible, but I'm sure it's going to have some complications. Um, and um, there's, there's one question that I haven't cleared. So if you look at uh, the package code, it tells you in one place that installing packages by version is not possible. So you can't tell it to install give me s something. It can't do that. But then you can put those dependencies within the packages, which is kind of weird. So I haven't figured out what the difference there is and what the reason for that is. Uh, but that's relatively minor. I mean, in the worst case, it just parses out and tells the user that that's not possible. And um, yeah, otherwise, it's mostly a matter of plugging it into a VR mode and turning it into a nice, decent package. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, questions, tips, feedback, ideas? Yes. So, uh, when the test fails, can I actually somehow get to the point where exactly it failed? The, the file, the stream, and so on? Um, the idea is that the test, when the test fails, that's the reason I didn't uh, uh, implement closing, killing Emacs when the test fails, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's possible to uh, call it uh, like this. Um, so you just pass it debug init, I think, and what this does is it sets uh, uh, debug on error to true on startup, and then you got all your uh, trace back and uh, your normal debugging tools, etc. on startup. So that should work. Mm -hmm. Yes. The web server is making the same from us too. From the news is my code in the background. Yeah, exactly. So the thing is, you still write your tests totally normally as ERT, as ERT, and uh, then what you, the command line does is, so this is um, something I got used to using this ABR mode, where you can, so ABR mode has uh, configuration, right? You can, um, a second. so yeah, this is one more thing I wanted to uh, show. Uh, hold on one second. So you can configure the ABM mode using a file like this at the base of the, uh, the project where you tell it to run which command, right? So uh, this is very useful because this gives you the chance to modify the um, options that you're passing to the test. So here, for example, you can uh, pytest xq, uh, trace back native, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, so this way you can tell Emacs to do whatever you want. And what you're doing is you're just calling the script, right? That's the only thing that you're uh, doing. So you can call ERT, and uh, or you can use something else, and you just need to uh, change your um, test script to do whatever you need it to do. Yes? That's, yeah, that's exactly what you asked. So the thing is that's, um, uh, I'm sure that's possible through ERT. So I mean, the, the, this is exactly the issue with debugging, the, testing your editor in your editor, right? So of, of course you can just run all your code, all your tests and modify your uh, extensions within e Emacs, but Emacs doesn't have the capability, as far as I know, of sandboxing within itself. So you can't tell it, to like, let's say you've got a mode, ABM mode, and you can't tell it like, okay, this ABM mode, you know what, this is different from that ABM mode that I always want to use, it should always be correct, don't touch it. But run this in the sandbox, you can't do that. And because of that, uh, you need to call another Emacs process from the command line, in which uh, your test and your new code run. And um, then I'm sure you can do the gimmickries that you do in your normal Emacs, uh, uh, process in your normal Emacs editor, you can do them there too. There are two caveats, of course. First of all, you don't want to load your normal init uh, directory because that's going to take a while, probably. 
it's going to like ask you should I load the uh, buffers uh, and then we'll start some modes, etc. etc. It might take a while. That's uh, one caveat. Um, actually, that's the only caveat. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, two, if I may. Well, I'm not a Can you speak a bit? No. <laughs> uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a Python library that's supposed to uh, kind of give you the all the share and the uh, run and stuff. Uh, but if you haven't mentioned it, is there a way to actually integrate the Google library with that so it doesn't just text with the uh, short commands? So that's, I mean, the, the Python has diverged recently. There used to be this virtual app, now there are a number of tools. So there's BitM, there's Poetry, there's, uh, and I mean, actually, they, there used to be all these other options too. So there was, what was that thing called again? Uh, from the Zorb world, there was this whole other world of dependencies. What was that thing called? You have the T, I think. So it looks like that thing is dead. No one's using anyone. But yeah. Yeah, definitely. So that's the aim of chain, uh, of having these options which are separate from each other. So, for example, this is the uh, VE create command. And so there's a VE create command which uh, runs if there's no virtual end. And there's the install command which runs after the uh, virtual end is created and then the dependency runs. And you can also, it's, there's an option to skip this. So you can just say don't use a virtual end at all. Because, for example, this old tool, whose name still obeys me, uh, created everything within the directory and then it loaded from that directory. So it wasn't, so virtual app creates it in, by default, it creates them in uh, home and then slash dot virtual apps. But this other tool created everything in the, the same directory, just like mode does. But by skipping the virtual app creation, we can, uh, and changing the VE create command, create an environment in the current directory, we can achieve all of those. So I've worked in many different environments using these options and they all work. So there's more reason to work. Um, yes. One more yes, of course. So you had a that you had some kind of Python project, and you had some tests for that, and you used Emacs and run those tests, and then you wrote the library for Emacs. And so you look like you have those tests. Is it a literal test? That yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happened. And now you're doing uh, sandboxing thing. Yeah. Uh, for that. So obviously, you're going to write tests for the sandbox thing. Exactly. So because she's at least the curtain end at any point. So probably we'll see you next year. <laughs> sandbox or sandbox? No, the thing is, it ends with the tests. That was exactly what I was thinking. I was like, okay, I wrote this code here uh, in test.el, and now I have to write tests for this code. Uh, which, but then that's answer because then I can write those tests and then I can run the tests within the sandbox that I create using this uh, code. So that's like the, the yeah. final step of recurring. Just want to make sure you don't go to <laughs> <laughs> two years <laughs> later, probably be shoveled with all the body. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, there's one thing that I forgot mentioning that's actually the next step, but the thing is that's relatively straightforward that's mocking. But there are good mocking libraries for Emacs already. Um, so in Python and in dynamic languages, it's something that you always use. But in Python, in ELS, for example, that's one of the reasons why these tests, these tests are pretty convoluted. Because what happens is, um, so what, like, let's say, for example, this thing is testing that there's a replacement virtual app that's been created. If you pass it a command, then it should do so. And then this, this is a big because what it's doing is it's Creating a directory, copying Python code in there, etc., etc., because I don't use mocking. If you use mocking, then you can actually check that certain commands are being run, right? Because what ABR mode does is it runs shell command to a string and then it runs a command and then it's what comes like, etc. But how do you check the side effect of that? You look at the directory, whether something happened. So because of that, I have all these files. So this test is actually, yeah, so. There's actually even a setup file that's being written. So yeah, if I get mocking to work within the sandbox thing, then I also won't have to do all of this shit. If that's it, I'm going to end my presentation. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, and then that's got a remote print. Are there any other questions? Okay. Should I stop recording? Uh, yeah, why not?